Good morning, everyone. First of all, thank you to Season Chips for having me. My name is Kishan. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Dishk, or a Bangalore-based uh, food tech startup. So I'm so glad that uh, Matthew Lang, Dr. Matthew Lang went before me because he's laid the foundation for what I'm going to talk about. Um, and, and we're certainly looking forward to working with him and his research group on some of the things that he just talked about. There we go. So just a quick intro. Um, I'm not going to go into the details, but just to say that our entire core team, we've tried to build a team that is entirely had industry experience. We're all big foodies at heart. I worked at Just Eat uh, in 2011 for three or four years, and then my entire team have worked across the spectrum, FMCG companies, restaurant chains, and other food tech companies. So we're all passionate foodies, and, and then hopefully you'll see where we're going with this. So why did we start DISHK? Um, and it goes back to something that Dr. Matthew Lang said. He said that ultimately, whatever you eat to change behavior and habits, it has to taste good. And of course, we have all eat three times a day at least, and it doesn't always taste good. Sometimes it tastes average, sometimes it tastes terrible. And we've kind of got used to thinking about and accepting that that's just the way it is. And, and for me, that was kind of some of the things that I used to think, that, why is that the case? Why is it that we eat so frequently, and it's the most personal thing we do, perhaps, in all of our uh, behaviors, and we do it so frequently, but it still doesn't matter that it's okay to have an average meal, whether you're cooking, whether you're at a restaurant, whether you're getting a delivery, any of those situations. So I thought there's something that needs to be done in the world of personalization, and how can data and technology essentially address this problem? And having worked at Just Eat, you could see that there's a ton of data being ingested by that platform, but we weren't doing anything with it to enable a more positive consumer experience, essentially. So how we think about personalization, and, and, and I'll tell you in a minute how AI can apply to this, is essentially there are three core principles to food choices that, that we think about in our technology. One is that, obviously, my tastes are completely personal to me. It's like a fingerprint. Um, and so for me, personally, I love pineapple on pizza, and that's often a, a divisive topic in nature. Number two is, in terms of the actual taste of the food, when I'm making a choice, whether it's at a new place, at a new restaurant, or at my favorite restaurant, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, ideally, I'd like to have something I love the taste of, but actually, the one thing I know for sure is that I do not want to have a bad food experience. I'm, uh, we're all averse to risk on some level, right? Um, and to that bad experience. And no matter how much I love pepperoni pizza or whatever my favorite dish is, I can't eat it over and over again. I need d diversity and variety in the kind of food that I eat. So these are the kind of three pillars of how we think about consumers and choice. And so going back to that point, how can technology, data, and science come together to ensure that every single time we all eat, the food tastes absolutely delicious? We all know the benefit of uh, having a great tasting meal, right? We feel great, maybe we're more productive. Um, you know, it just, the feeling is awesome. And of course, <laughs> being a foodie myself, of course, I've, I can talk passionately about it. Many people eat quite functionally, but I'm sure even they would argue that having a great tasting meal can really change your experience. So what do we do? Uh, essentially, we're a taste prediction technology company or flavor prediction technology company. And so our sort of bold statement is, can our AI, what we call our food brain, essentially know what you want to eat before you do? And so that's the challenge we've set ourselves, and that is, that is a big challenge. And as you could see from some of the stuff you saw in the earlier presentation, how complex this world is. And so what are the factors that influence taste and flavor? Because of course, in order to be a prediction uh, uh, flavor prediction technology company, you have to understand it to be able to model it. And of course, rightly, as, as was earlier said, there are five broad buckets that we've created, which are essentially you know, my sense organs, my biology, my taste perceptors, my mood going into a meal, how do I feel, and, and my values, and how do I come out of that meal, and the, how does the food affect my next meal? My ethnicity, and all of our ethnicities. So I'm from, actually, I was born in London, lived most of my life in London, but I'm of Indian origin, of course, and I've actually recently, last four years of my life, lived in India. How has that journey of my life affected my sort of cultural expectation, taste expectations of food? And we all have our own stories in that regard. Of course, the recipe, how it was cooked, what ingredient qualities were used, what particular quality of ingredients, where were they sourced, how long has it been since they were harvested from, from the soil. All these different factors affect taste. And of course, the real-time context, context. Who am I eating with? When was the last time I ate? 
um, the price, the weather, all these different things come into account. So essentially, this you could argue is our technology problem statement. And so at the, at the core of it, we have this flavor prediction, flavor AI, or food brain as we call it. And there are four pillars to how it works. Number one is, with any kind of AI or machine learning model, as you probably know, you have to have a ton of data that you're feeding into the system and training the technology. And so we've built a proprietary data set. As you saw earlier, the data is everywhere, right? Sensors, um, academic journals, cookbooks, you know, user-generated reviews, Instagram, data is everywhere. And so can we ingest all of that data from all the different places and essentially interpret it, make sense of it, and, and create these ontologies? And so we have a, a food database ourselves, a recipe database, which we're continuing to uh, build and grow over time. But the thing that we think is interesting about our data set is that it's perhaps some of the, uh, one of the more rich, richer data sets in the sense that we have around 26 to 28 attributes per dish, everything from a cuisine origin to the aroma profile of a dish, to taste texture, to the dominant ingredients. There are so many factors that go into every single recipe that we have to understand. And of course, we partner with our, our uh, customers and other data sources to get consumer data. So you know, if we were working with a Just Eat type company, they would give us your behavior data, your transaction data. And that allows us to implicitly understand your, your preferences in terms of ingredients, dishes, cuisines, flavors, and aromas. So that's, that's what our technology does. It implicitly understands what you do and, and, and your preferences and affinities towards different things in the world of food. Um, and of course, on the other side, I'm not going to dive into the food science part, but of course you saw all the kind of things that we have to take account of on the world of food science, which we partner with institutions um, and academia to essentially work with them and, and, and improve our algorithms. So let's talk about the commercial applications. We, you know, you've seen a lot of the, the history and, and the background and all the complexity that goes into understanding this world of food and how complicated it is, but what can we do with it as businesses? And so. Uh, some of this stuff is what we do, but some of it is actually kind of what could be done. So it's easy to obviously say that doing personalized recommendations or a recommendation engine, perhaps you can call it the Netflix of food, is something obvious to do and something easy in terms of this scale of complexity. Um, and so that's where we are today as a company. That's what we have. But um, even then, it's presented with many challenges, as, as, you, as you saw, your mood going into a meal, your ethnicity. How can technology understand all of these things in order to make the right recommendation for you at that exact point in time? And so that's what we have today. Something that's coming up in the near future, and, and I think that this is far more powerful in terms of innovation, is can we, can we use this pr uh, taste uh, prediction technology or this food brain to tell restaurants and FMCG brands what should be the next product that they launch? So giving them that predictive capability, the analytics and insights into that. So if you looked at McDonald's menu, and you've maybe consumed McDonald's in more than one country, you can see that no longer is it the same Big Mac, McChicken sandwich, filet of fish I mean, they have those items, but the rest of the menu is entirely localized towards tastes. And they've done a good job of innovating their menu over time. But could our technology tell McDonald's what is the next burger they need to launch in every single one of their key markets? You know, the theme of, uh, in FMCG right now is sugar reduction. Can we tell Nestle what's the next chocolate bar they need to build, which has obviously got a lot less sugar but tastes just as good as Milky Bar? And so that's what we're, that's what we're working on right now, and we'll be launching the beta for soon. And even further afield, something that really excites me personally as a, as a consumer and has great consumer benefits is a universal taste passport. What I mean by that is today, if somebody's using our recommendation engine, let's say Just Eat is using it, but I don't just consume food through Just Eat. I go to the supermarket, I go to different restaurants that I like. So only Just Eat knows me potentially if they're using, let's say, our technology or somebody's technology. But how can everybody understand who I am, no matter where I go, no matter where I do my shopping, no matter which fine dine restaurant I go to, which, uh, which hospital, wherever I go, how can they understand me? And so. The concept of a universal taste pass, what we think is really interesting. Imagine us as consumers explicitly giving our permission, and it's an interesting topic for sure, given all the data privacy concerns right now, but imagine we were willing to do so, like the Google login, Google login of taste preferences. Imagine then that being available at all the platforms and all the places where I consume food. They can instantly personalize to everything that I like. Again, going back to that mission of having a delicious meal every time I eat. And so 
Another application, another sort of taking this even further forward, is that I'm sure some of you have been to these restaurants, these kind of experiential restaurants, where there's no menu, and they just ask you, what don't you eat? So, okay, I don't eat beef or fish, I don't like my food too spicy. That's what you tell them, and then they'll do a four or five course meal for you. And it's a bit of fun, and it's a nice experience. But ultimately, there's still going to be hit and miss in that experience as well, because they're just kind of removing the exclusions, but not thinking about what you actually love. And so, taking that technology, like I said, one step further, is could there be a world where restaurants don't have menus? and they just know who you are and know what you love, and you can just walk in and eat whatever, and you'll get served to you. Those of you who have seen Star Trek may recognize that that kind of replicator technology was done in, uh, shown in those uh, TV programs. So also another application of this kind of food brain technology is can we look to identify novel uh, recipes and novel ingredients that go together with things that we love, for example? So, I recently were, had a, a chat with some of the team at Nutella and, and Ferrero, which is the company that owns Nutella, and we kind of looked at what are the world of ingredients that are being used with Nutella? How are people consuming it? What would they like to change about it? You know, how can we reduce the sugar level in Nutella, for example? And so our AI went and examined the world of all the ingredients, looked at, looked at Nutella as a product down to the flavor compound level, looked at the world of ingredients and came up with a list of different ingredients that would go well or different products that would go well with Nutella. Bread was number one, unsurprisingly, at 97%. And we all know that's true because that's generally how we eat Nutella. But what was interesting was that soy sauce was very high up on the list. And I, I'm sure probably, there's probably unlikely to be anyone in the room who's tried soy sauce and Nutella. Uh, and they were equally, no one in that room that I was talk, when I was talking to them had ever tried it. But we actually did an, a taste test internally at our company, and we were surprised that actually it was pretty good actually together with a bit of bread, Nutella, and different ingredient quantity levels. And so then we tried to validate what the AI told us. We looked into the world of social media and see, is there anybody already doing this? And fair, uh, sure enough, people in Asia, there are a number of them who are making noodle recipes with Nutella and soy sauce. So it was a um, fascinating experiment for us, and I think the point of this is that how can we engage with brands and, and, re and create a new experience and so that we can kind of, you know, take our favorite products and do something new with them? And I don't know how clear this is, probably not that clear, so apologies for that. But there's an infographic of the world's most popular beer brands across every single market. I think it's the market leader in every brand at that point in time. And what our AI can also do is help to understand why these things are popular. Of course, marketing plays a big role in that, and we're not saying that it doesn't, but putting marketing to one side from pure flavor and taste perspective, why is it that so many different brands are like, there's very few re repetitions, I think, if any, in that. Now, of course, some of them have the same parent company, but I doubt that the, the beers taste the same. So what is it about the taste and the local cuisine signatures of those areas and those regions that we can align and understand better, and how can that help us with new product development? Now, Heinz, um, obviously we all love Heinz ketchup, and in India, <laughs> it's an amazing story, like, you can't have Heinz in India without chili sauce. Obviously, we all know that Indians generally like a spicier profile of food, but in a commercial sense, what do brands need to do to localize their products their world-famous products in order to be successful in markets. We've seen large FMCG companies exit countries where they haven't localized. I'm not going to name names, but that's happened. And um, so to stay relevant, what can AI tell you about local taste preferences and what you can do with your successful product set in terms of tweaks to formulation in order to make it more relevant to a local market? Going back to personalization and recommendation, it's not just about creating a, everybody having a delicious food experience, but of course for a business it's also about profit. And so you can see here from some of the results of our technology and our customers that are using our recommendation engine, you can see that it can impact your bottom line by increasing conversion rates, it can increase what people spend, and that can lead to ultimately obviously more revenue and profit. And the final thing I'm going to say is that our world essentially for us as a business is a merging of the food world and the technology world. And I think this slide, maybe you've seen it before, um, it shows the real disparity that's going on in this industry. What can we do to make sure that the food businesses are spending more money in R&D, and how can we help them get a better return on that spend? So that's the final thought I'd like to leave you with. I'd like to thank you for your time. We're exhibiting at G28. Thank you for listening.